bricks and stuff at it. Yeah. <laughs> well, boom. I'm Thundercloud Cloud here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. Watch the way the garbage leaving rainbows after it rains. Uh, hopefully tonight I'll be joined by the Rogery, but we'll have to wait and we'll have to just see. Are you going to join us tonight or what? No. Nah. No? Maybe later. Huh? Well, let us know anyway. Yeah, I'm stuffed. All right. Cool. Well, it looks like it's just me and you out there in the rest of the world too. Well... What a day, what a week, what a night it's been here in Gyra. Um, today I was uh, really, really have um, a big, big, big thank you to um, Laszlo Sabo who gave me this box here full of poetry books for the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame's Poetry Library and Archive to preserve Australian poetry for all time for all Australians and all people of this uh, amazing land, big thanks um, to Laszlo. And um, so I've uh, yeah, chosen some poems out of here to read to you tonight and we'll to kick off the night. I'd like to begin with acknowledgement of country here in Gaira. We are on Band by Country. And I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present, emerging and their continuing connection to the land up here in Banbai country and all around Gondwana, uh, currently known or also known as Australia. And um, pay res my respects and honour all the elders, the Indigenous, the First Nations, as I said, past, present and merging. I'm going to start off tonight with this book here, Where There's Life, There's Spirit by Norm Newland. This book was written in uh, 19, uh, uh, well published in uh, 1988. Um, Norm Newland has been writing poetry for three years, this was in 1988, and Aboriginal Norm says that a lot of this book is based on my not life, my experiences and my family, as well as some political and environmental statements. He wrote his first poem to avoid writing an essay while studying at Sydney College of Advanced Education. Norm's poetry is powerful and direct. This poetry speaks to both black and white communities and its author Norm Newland is destined to take his place with the best of Australian poets. It's dedicated to his Aboriginal family, friends and the Aboriginal struggle and he wanted to thank the Aboriginal Arts Board for the grant. Without the grant this book would have only been a dream. The first one I'm going to read out to you is um, this land. Australia, Felix Australis, New Holland, the great southern land. All the names this land was called until they decided on Australia. Someone asked my Koori friend what it was called before a white man came. Chris just smiled and answered, hours before the white man came. And with that, I'd also like to recognise and acknowledge that sovereignty has never been ceded. And technically, Australia, because there's never been a treaty, sovereignty's never been ceded. So Australia is still at war, technically, with the Aboriginal people and the Indigenous people of this country. And perhaps it's time to have a declaration of independence and get rid of this corrupt government that's currently existing. The timeless man. That's my political comment. Poets can do that because poets are the unofficial legislators of the world. 
Low, scrubby pines form a windbreak for this silent, ancient figure that sits cross-legged on the parched red earth. Deep eyes set of wisdom gaze at the mulga smoke, watching it climb in a lazy spiral up where the eagles soar, high in the southern sky. Cheeks and forehead stained ochre red from many corroborees past, when they sang the songs and danced the dance that told of the dreaming's past. Hair as white as mountain snow tied back in a straight, tight bun, ageless, ageless man in a timeless land, 40 millennia or more. Dream on, free spirit, dream on, may the dreaming never end. Trespasses by Norm Newland. Trespasses. When the battle dust had settled and the fallen taken away, the muffled drum beats sounded for the heroes of the day. They only picked up red coats, not the brown skinned men. Their bones were left to bleach white in the sun. Just naked pagan savages that were in the settler's way. This land belongs to England now, so you must obey the law. The law they broke was white man's law. Trespassing, they called it. Then the redcoats came to kill this peaceful native band. Please tell me, Mr. White Man, how we can be trespassers on our own true tribal land. Well, it's like this. You see, as a person of Irish, English, Norman, Scandinavian, German, Welsh, Scottish descent, what happened when they wrote the Magna Carta with common law, they enshrined the idea of property ownership, which in Brian law, which precedes common law, Magna Carta, Brian law was the law of the Irish, there was no ownership. So just like Aboriginal LORE, there was no property ownership. And so the robber baron kings decided that when you put up a fence, you enclosed land. It's called the Enclosure Act. But then you own the land. So first of all, they went to Ireland and they invaded Ireland. They enclosed the land and said, OK, we got a fence and this is now ours. And you were driven off. And then they took the Irish food and they took it back to England. So they stole the land from Ireland. And Ireland used to be like 90% covered in big forest. And they cut down all the oak trees. So they took that back to England and stole it. And that's what property ownership does. Because by, like under, well, Annex's theory is that um, ownership is a kind of violence. By saying, this is mine. I'm denying it from you. So they were what we call well, anarcho-syndicalists, really. It's closest to our anarcho-syndicalist theory. And they were a syndicate all working together with anarchy, with no structure. Anarchy is an architecture. So um, both the Irish, and then they did it to the, well, all around the world. They also did it to here in Australia, and they cut down all the forests and shipped it off back home. So that's how it happens. And they introduced a punitive justice system based on punishment instead of compensatory satory justice of Aboriginal law or Brown law from Ireland. Um, and that's how they did it, so in answer to his question. Moving right along, this one, um, A Season of Dreams by Jade Highland, Poems and Drawings by Jade Highland. Um, all right, Jade Highland um, was a lecturer in theatre at Charles Sturt University in Bathurst, and this was printed by Charles Sturt University in Bathurst. I'm just going to read one out of here tonight for you. 
And the one I'm going to read is called uh, Maturity. Arty, farty, tart and rooty toot toot. All my life I've lived in me boot. Always thought life was a dark, smelly place with a toe, a heel and a severe lack of space. Well, I was grubbing around one day on me soul, looking for meanings, a reason, a goal. While I was looking, me stumbled, face flattened, discovered the way to get to me hat. And what a view met me, dim little eyes, on top of all that me felt clever and wise. Then I looked down on me, dark smelly feet, made me feel nauseously giddy and weak. Up sprang a wind, me fuddled me fat, with a menacing grin blew off me hat. Down, down it fell with me close in toe into me lap, I started to flow. Felt that much better, warmer inside, safer in shelter, me sat down and cried. Rivers became torrents, lakes became seas, the tears of relief were soon up to me knees. All of me clothes were starting to float, I was going to drown and needed a boat. Arty fart art and rooty toot toot. What should flood pass but me lovely old boot? Quick as a flash, back in it me dashed. I've been in the world, now I'm back in me boot. Yeah, maturity. By J. Highland. Moving right along. The Song of the Humpback Whales by Jill. Hellier, selected verse by Jill Hellier, um, published in, I don't know, 1981, copyright, first published, 1981, by um, Bath's Productions, Melbourne, printed around Globe Press. Okay, um, a little bit about Jill Hellier. Jill Hallier is an Australian from the Second Fleet, born in North Sydney in April 1925. She's written poetry since high school days and has work published in Australia and some overseas anthologies since she was 19. She helped found the Australian Society for Authors and was its first executive secretary, secretary from 1963 to 1971. Her first Book of Verse, The Exile, was published by Alpha in 1969, and her novel, Not Enough Savages, was published by Alpha in 1975. Her writing has been, writing time has been restricted by the fact that she's raised three children, two of them severely disabled, unable, unaided. This has given her great insight and a wealth of material to write about. In 1981, Jill Hellyer was awarded a Senior Literary Fellowship by the Literary Literature Board of the Australia Council. So, yes, worthy of the Hall of Fame, a famous writer, a famous poet. You might not have heard of her, but definitely did a lot for Australian writing. And um, I'm going to read... Well, it's called The Song of the Humpback Whales, and I'm going to read the very first poem in here, the title of the book, Song of the Humpback Whales. From oceans huge, with time the whales surface and plunge in a rolling of hills the curious, soft, indigo explosion of their cries that trail like comets in the night are heard as Trumpet calls, submerged, sharp, shuddering, as the spatial music of gulls, the sounds of blunt tugs nosing mournfully through eternal mist. It's a salt white sorcery, they sing, of Arctic pilgrimage, the bleak migration, ordained by the rhythm of seasons, buffeted by storms of their known world they flow as we ourselves in terrible formation trapped each a lifetime in compelling seas plunging half blinded calling one to another from green scarped waves set on divergent courses but frozen frozen to our destiny 
song of the humpback whales by Jill Hellier. And I'm just going to pour myself a little bit of tea here. We've got Collier, Scott Cola, ginseng, and the nettle tea. It's all good for your brain, good for your longevity, too. Mmm, good stuff. I hope you got a warm cup of tea with you tonight. If not, now's probably a good time to go and stick the kettle on. The next one. Brain Damage. Festers and a Louisville Truck songbook by Michael Sharkey. This one was published in uh, 1981, again, uh, uh, by um, Possum Press in Armadale. Fat Possum Press, sorry. Fat Possum Press, okay. And um, the one I'm going to do is on Armadale Moonlight. Why? Because it mentions Gyra, and here I am in the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in Gyra. And here's a bit of news for you. This Friday, we're going to be out of lockdown up here, which means the Gyra Farmers and Craft Market will be on at 8.30 till 12.30 on Saturday morning. Yes, it's true. The Gyra Farmers and Craft Market here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame is the only every Saturday market in the whole of this area up here. Um, the plateau, the, the tablelands up in Banbai country. Um, so yeah, it's on. And we got eggs, we got like honey, Gyra potatoes, we've got cakes, and whatever else is up here, tomatoes, produce, and lots of crafts and stuff like that. And this weekend, um, I think even Roger might even, Roger Rogery Clark, might even have some of his um, amazing Barkindji Aboriginal art for sale. So come on down, come on up, up the hill, because everything is downhill from Gyra. Brain Damage, Festers and a Louisville Truck, Ford's Truck Songbook by Michael Sharkey. And this is on Armadale Moonlight. No, the moon is not the same light that Uralis sees. The wind does not shake Gyra's trees. The frogs that croak along Black Mountain do not chant your praises, Armadale. The swamp has died, the air is stale. Yeah. Mangled Psyche Blues. Got drunk last night. Drunk the night before. If I had money, I'd drink more. It's Saturday night. Chuck on the floor, chuck on the bed, chuck on the car, chuck in your head. I'm gonna drink all night. Write pretty words, drink bad wine, smoke bad grass, get weird, feel fine. I'm gonna get smashed, all right. There you go. That's Mangled Psyche Blues by Michael Sharkey. There's another one here. Where is it? Bright and clear. My love is gone, the ocean's far, the mountains are between us. Stars shine, crickets call, the silence of them chills us. Water chokes, the sunlight breaks, the cold rain falls on stones here. Foreign trees drop leaves and freeze and crack the gums are dying. Pale leaves cling, the earth is brown, the desert flowers bloom here. Moving right along. Okay, this one. Um, drawings are in miniature from New England to Old. Drawings and Poems by David Evans. This one here was published in um, 1979. It's got some lovely drawings in it. There, there. 
there's a whole lot of drawings in here. But I'm going to read to you uh, the very first one. Moonby. Now, a lot of people, some people know Moonby. Some people don't know Moonby. Moonby's famous because it's got a big chook. Now you know. Moonby has a big chook, which I've climbed a couple of times. The other thing about Moonby is that it's full of chook farms um, in chook sheds where they grow chooks. And pretty much if you stop in Moonby, you, it smells like chook shit. Yeah, it's true. Don't stop there too long. Um, but anyway, someone once said to me that like, every time like all the chooks in Moonby got a chook flu, that often the people in Armadale up the hill that year would get a chook flu as well. Mmm, interesting, hey? Because the wind would blow all the chook dust and flew up the hill and then they'd all get sick in Armadale. But that's uh, just hearsay. Anyway, there's no such thing as a flu anymore. Um, it's just disappeared. Amazing. Moonbeam. The village sleeps tensely along its loud road, porches sunken into low shade behind an anarchy of posts in lines which vaguely recollect the symmetry of an old dream. Comatose, in shells of rain-burnt iron, these fragile houses cast their scale and prepare to hang their raw bones darkly on the edges of the day. Well, there you go. Moonbeam, place of the big chalk. Tree of Knowledge, again, by David Evans. Each morning sees the old men sit in rings of smoke across the road that overlooks the river wall. Under this pine their wisdom thaws and flows in not slow sun pulses round the table where the shadows fall. This is the place where all their lives are given shape and seen at last as revelations of a course of things that breeds truth from apocrypha and points in triumph backwards to their histories as its source. Thank you, David Evans. All right, now this one here, this book here is falling to bits. It's um, Shaw Nelson. Sorry, Shaw Nielsen's Selected Poems, um, published by A&R Modern Poets. But um, John Shaw Nielsen was born in Panola in South Australia in 1872, and he died 70 years later in Melbourne. So that would make that 1942. His education was elementary and inadequate. He lived always both with his family and as a wanderer by the sweat of his brow as a shearer, a farmhand, a quarryman, a road mender, and at Yalon as a mine worker. His eyesight was poor and he often had to write by candlelight or even dictate his verses to some of his tent mates. Yet this simple, Gentle man produced some of Australia's finest and most delicate lyrical poems. So, Shaw Nielsen selected poems, and I've got one in here that I've selected. Under a courage on. Here is the ecstasy of sun-fed wine and song drink. It is melody under a courage on. What sweetest space on earth for glistened youth and maid to find the quiet mirth under the quiet shade? What sweeter place than this for loving eyes to see, for lovers' lips to kiss? Under the lover's tree? 
It is the time to blow hot kisses on the spring when dreams begin to go under the blossoming. Let not the mouth be cold, love is not over long, only today's gold under a courage on. I like that one. Hmm. There's another one here I had picked out, page 29. The bard and the lizard. The lizard leans into October. He walks on the yellow and green. The world is awake and unsober. It knows where the lovers have been. The wind, like a violin cello, comes up and commands him to sing. He says to me, courage, good fellow, we live by the folly of spring. A fish that the sea cannot swallow, a bird that can never yet rise, a dreamer no dreamer can follow, the snake is at home in his eyes. He tells me the paramount treason, his words have the resolute ring, away with the homage to reason, we live by the folly of spring. The leaves are about him, the berry is close to the red and the green, his eyes are too old to be merry, and he knows where the lovers have been, and yet he could never be bitter, he tells me no sorrowful thing, the autumn is less than a twitter, we live by the folly of spring. As green as the light on a salad, he leans in the shade of a tree, he has a good breath of the ballad. The strength that is down on the sea. How silent he creeps in the yellow. How silent and yet he can sing. He gives me, good morning, good fellow. We live by the folly of spring. I scent the alarm of the faded who love not the light and the play. I hear the assault of the jaded. I hear the intolerant bray. My friend has the face of a wizard. He tells me no desolate thing. I learn from the heart. Of the lizard, we live by the folly of spring. Yeah, and that's it. By Shaw Nelson. Now, this book here, I'm going to be very gentle with this one. This book here was um, published in uh, MDCCCXC. Yeah, that's... Um, 1890. So it's uh, 131 years old. Um, Kendall's poems. Um, Henry Kendall, uh, Henry Clarence Kendall, was born in 1839 and died in 1882 at the age of 43. Um, he is known as one of Australia's greatest lyric poets. And um, tonight I'm going to read to you two of his um, poems. Maybe three. The first one, Araluan. He wrote two poems called... Araluen, the first one that I'll read to you tonight. But his second one was uh, dedicated to his daughter, also called Araluen, who died when she was young. But this is not that one, this is the other Araluen. Araluen. River myrtle rimmed and set deep among unfooted dells. Daughter of grey hills of wet borne by moss and yellow wells. Now that soft September lays tender on thee, tender hands on thee and thine, let me think of blue-eyed days, star-like flowers and leaves of shine. Cities soil the life with rust, water banks are cool and sweet, river tired of noise and dust, here I come to rest my feet. 
Now the month from shade to sun fleets and sings supremest songs. Now the willful wood winds run through the tangled cedar throngs. Here the cushion tufts and tarns where the sumptuous noontide lies. Here are seen by flags and ferns summer's large luxurious eyes. On this spot one winter casts eyes of Ruth and spares its green from his bitter sea nursed blasts, spears of rain and hailstones keen. Rather here abideth spring, lady of a lovely land, dear to leaf and fluttering wind, deep in blossoms by breezes fanned. Faithful friend beyond the main, friend that time nor change makes cold, now like ghosts return again, pallished, pallid perished days of old. Ah, the days, the old, old theme, never stale but never new, floating like a pleasant dream back to me and back to you. Since we rested on these slopes, seasons fierce have beaten down, ardent loves and blossoming hopes, loves that lift and hopes that crown. But believe me still, mine eyes often fill with light that springs from divinity which lies ever at the heart of things. Solace do I sometimes find where you used to hear with me songs of stream and forest wind, tones of wave and harp like tree. Araloo and home of dreams fairer for its powerful glade than the face of Persian streams or the slopes of Syrian shade. Why should I still love it so, friend and brother far away? Ask the winds that come and go, what hath brought me here today? Evermore of you I think, when the leaves begin to fall, where our river breaks its brink, and the rest is over all. Evermore in quiet lands, friend of mine beyond the seas, memory comes with cunning hands, stays and paints your face for me. That's our Lewin. One of Henry Kendall's more famous poems, or well known poems, is Bellbirds. Now, Bellbirds by Henry Clarence Kendall. By channels of coolness, the echoes are calling. And down the dim gorges I hear the creek falling. It lives in the mountain where moss and the sedges touch with their beauty the banks and the ledges. Through breaks of the cedar and sycamore bowers struggles the light that is love to the flowers. And softer than slumber and sweeter than singing, the notes of the bellbirds are running and ringing. The silver-voiced bellbirds, the darlings of daytime, they sing in September their songs of the Maytime. When shadows wax strong and the thunderbolts hurtle, they hide with their fear in the leaves of the myrtle. When rain and the sunbeams shine mingled together, they start up like fairies that follow fair weather, and straight away the hues of their feathers unfolded are the green and the purple, the blue and the golden. October, the maiden of bright yellow tresses, loiters for love in these cool wildernesses, loiters knee deep in the grasses to listen where dripping rocks gleam and the leafy pools glisten. This is the time when the water moons splendid break with their gold and are scattered or blended over the creeks till the woodlands have warning of the songs of the bellbird and the wings of the morning. Welcome as waters unkissed by the summers are the voices of bellbirds to thirsty far comers. When fiery December sets foot in the forest and the need of the wayfarer presses the sorest, 
Pent in the ridges forever and ever, the bellbirds direct him to spring and to river. With ring and with ripple, like runnels whose torrents are toned by the pebbles and leaves in the currents. Often I sit looking back to a childhood, mixed with the sights and the sounds of the wildwood, longing for power and the sweetness to fashion, lyrics with beats like the heartbeats of passion, songs interwoven of lights and of laughters borrowed from bellbirds in far forest rafters. So I might keep in the city and alleys the beauty and strength of the deep mountain valleys, charming to slumber the pain in my losses with glimpses of creeks and a vision of mosses. Yeah, and that's a, a most beautiful piece of poetry, um, lyrical rhyming poetry. And you can also hear me reading that out alone, as, low, as well as Aralua. If you go to the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame YouTube channel, you can catch up and see all the recordings of these Wednesday Words Live Poetry Nights with me, with other poets, Steve Wordsmith, with Wiradjuri, uh, on the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame YouTube channel. So you can like go there, give it a thumbs up, give this a thumbs up now, hit the heart button and um, subscribe to the YouTube channel. All right, T.O., well, 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 that's um, it for me, not yet, because I've got my own to read out yet. Um, so what's coming up here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in Gyra, provided that the lockdown ends on Friday night, we have the Z Shorts Short Film Festival this Sunday the 12th, Sunday the 19th, Sunday the 26th of September at 2pm, their matinees, and it's an international short film festival showing in 23 countries around the world. But here in Gaira is the only place where you can come and see it in a whole Abanbai country and probably for a very far distance around. So um, go on to have a look through the Facebook uh, page of the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. You can uh, get your tickets there and through the link for Z Shorts and come along. And this Sunday, the 19th, Sunday the 12th, Sunday the 26th. And there's also a special screening on Friday the 24th of September at 6pm here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in Gaira. What else is coming up? In October, October the 15th, 16th and 17th, Gaira has the Trout Fest. Yes, the Trout Fest. We, where you can come, there will be markets all weekend. Our market's on Saturday here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, also down at Bolo. Plus, if you bring up um, a fishing rod with a fly on it, there'll be stocked trout in the dam down on the golf course, so you can go and catch yourself a trout. It's a competition. Plus, there'll be plenty of other things happening. Sunday morning, the 17th of October, here from 10 at 9 o'clock in the morning, is the Poet's Breakfast. Yes. Poet's breakfast. It's not a dog's breakfast, it's a poet's breakfast, it's true. And um, we'll be welcoming great poets like the local Dave Bearup, Steve Wordsmith, myself, um, hopefully Wiradjuri will be there, uh, Gladys Wilson and her poem, um, The Old Gum Tree. Um, so yeah, get along here um, to the Gyra Trout Fest, 15th, 16th, 17th of October. And on the 16th of October, we've also got a gig here. There'll be Pacific Island uh, dancing, the Vanuatu String Band, I hope. Hopefully the Solomon Island Band. And there'll be a new band, Mother of Ducks. Yes, it's a secret, but the secret's out. Mother of Ducks will be playing here Saturday night, the 16th of October. And it's a pirate theme night. So, we park gear. All right, moving right along. Good times and bad times, happy times and sad times. Well, I didn't think I would end up writing a poem about um, the one with that one that we're not allowed to say here, COVID, um, but I just said it, but I did. 
after all. Um, so we're going to start with what have I been writing this week? Okay. Um, Punitive justice is an abject failure. Welcome to 2021 colony of Australia, where rubber barons are called politicians taking corporate donations and do not listen. It's a short one. That was written about 14 minutes ago, or an hour and 14 minutes ago. Uh, okay, now, aren't we lucky? like to live in this like most abundant time of ever like seriously like we are blessed um with big gratitude to have all that we have like there's never been a moment more abundant time in entire human history in fact i so i believe that we actually produce two point two and a half times enough food to feed the entire population of the world how about that yeah So, yeah, an attitude of gratitude instead of an attitude of a victim. That's what I call this one, attitude of a victim. How do you react to the situations that surround? Do you act like a victim or get yourself up off the ground? You can be a victim of a system that you did not create or be grateful for opportunities and thankful that it's great. You can let the system depress or drive you insane or stop speaking like a whip slave because it's all in your brain. When the shit hits the fan and people start to die, you can celebrate a life lived well or like a victim cry. You can take control, build some wings and you can fly. Wings complain about the pain and never ever try. Like a spoiled brat who wants more and more and cries, we've more than ever before, and scarcity is lies. This is my perception. I'm not taking you to task, but if you cannot breathe, take off your fucking mask. If the system that you're living is causing you frustration, the only thing you can change is your own situation. Because you're the one responsible for the life you live. Anger, sadness just harms you, so you just need to forgive. If the system or situation is making you feel stuck, you're the only one who have to, has to change, as most don't give a fuck. And if you've lost control and surrounded by strife, get off your fucking ass and change your fucking life. Sorry I didn't give a language warning before that, but I'm not really sorry. Okay, moving right along. That was written this morning. This was written yesterday. Ah, uh, bum bum The governor. Disobey the governor, I call this. Governor said... Jump off the cliff and you'll fly and be free. Don't look first because you won't jump if you see. Jump off the cliff and you'll get your freedom back. So he jumped and he flew. He was named Obedient Jack. The ground came up fast as he flew quickly down. He free, wasn't happy, screamed, wore a frown, hit the ground. And the following is what the governor said you can have your freedom back but you'll quickly be dead jump off the cliff and you'll fly you can you can be free you can fly but he questioned authority didn't jump didn't die this happened to be the governor's darkest hour disobedient james questioned authority and took back his power said mr governor in my pocket you're pissing. I critically question authority and I critically listen. You go first, show me how to be free and fly. The governor jumped, James was free, and James didn't die. The moral of the story is it's often best to wait. Never jump off a cliff and get the governor to demonstrate. Never blindly follow the authority of the state. Don't rush to be first and it's best to patiently wait. 
and the compliant will give up their lives and don't see, while the disobedient question before jumping off cliffs to be free and realise not to blindly follow what the governor said because the blind lead the blind and the blind end up dead. Finally, there's one thing more that I've left to say. To be free, take back your power, question authority and disobey. And yeah, if you want disobey stickers, you can get them from me by sending me a message on, on my uh, Facebook messenger uh, through Australian Poetry Hall of Fame or through James Arthur Warren. Right, next one. Oh, it's a little pussy song. Well, it's about a cat. It's, uh, it's like how many words rhyme with at? This poem has no at in it, but a whole lot of words that rhyme with at. There once was a cat, was a cat. Really? Let's start again. Matt the cat, Matt the fat cat with a hat. There once was a cat and his name was Matt. He ate a lot of mice and he got very fat. He wore a big hat and he sat on a mat and his owner name Nat would give him a pat. The cat named Matt was a bit of a brat. One day he was chasing a gnat, bat and rat and ran onto the road and a truck made him flat and that was the end of the cat named Matt. And that's that. Yeah, that's that. Ooh! Lockdown! Yeah, probably needs a language warning. Yeah, probably. Language warning. Locked down inside the fear of others. Father's Day without sisters and brothers. Fear of dying with a life unlived. Fear of death and being unforgived. Time to reflect about how I treat myself, abuse this body or nurture my health. Fear of pain and take the easy route of pleasure, self-indulgence and not go out. Time to drop all my unhealthy shit, put the exercise clothes on and go for it. Stop the sugar chocolate, chips and dunk, become slim and fit in a spunky hunk. On the other hand, I could just complain about the pain or the lockups and also the rain. When I listen to my inner voice, it tells me I have a choice. To be strong and fit or nurture this body or sit inside and be a big nobody. Feeling sluggish, unwell and never fine. Our biggest choice is how we spend our time. I could moan, complain that life isn't great or get off my ass and become what I create. Fear of pain and complain about the rain, but everybody knows no pain, no gain. With what exactly are you filling your glass? When was the last time you moved your ass? Is this thing fate that you accept? Or will you take control and self-direct? The less I speak, the more I listen. I can hear the rainfall and it's truly pissing. Yeah. A short one. Not what you think, not what you say, not how you sink, not where you stay. You are that you are, I am that I am. How close is far? Where is I can? Oh, yeah, and give it a thumbs up, give it some likes, hit those buttons now, hit, hit the heart button, hit it, hit it, hit it. Put a comment down if you like it. It's a, um, the Matrix of Masks. Looking for likes. Social reinforcement of the ego. Hearts of encouragement and confirmation bias. Cares about virtue signaling. I am. Angry 
and outraged, giving away power, shocked by the awesomeness or stupidity. Laughing brings joy from external sources. Comment on the nature of social media emoticons. Sharing a copy of someone else's thoughts. Waiting anxiously for the next notification about my story in the matrix of masks. Fake book. All right. Yeah, another one about the matrix. Om. Not om, ah. You, you, om, I am. Fearless or fear of death. Feeding lives to the matrix. Butterflies emerging with wings. Babies born clean and amazing. Develops the illusion of masks. The play of life has many roles. Shadows of puppets projected on a wall. Familiarity breeds complacency. Beyond thinking is stepping out of the box. Pick up the key, open the door, shedding skins and squinting at the light. The labyrinth is the body, an illusion, running from shadows forever or not. Not. Not a mask in a matrix of obedience as a caged bird is set free, goldfish tipped from the bowl into an ocean, free of the craving and fear, playing in duality, cessation of being the self, beyond duality, drifting down the stream, timeless being unfolded or fear, bridging the existence of timelessness in the infinite I am beyond the thinking level of the mind. Um, that's it. A limerick. So a limerick. What is a limerick? Well, a limerick is a kind of five-line poem. It has... First, uh, what is it? Maybe be nine metrical feet, nine metrical feet, six metrical feet, six metrical feet. No, sorry, it's a three, three, two, two, three metric feet, and it's a A A B B A rhyming structure. Usually tells a little story. Um, a metrical feet, so a three metrical feet. Three is nine syllables. Six, uh, two metrical feet is six syllables. So um, here we go, a limerick. There once was a country called Australia whose governance was quite a failure. The oligarchs donated, the people frustrated, while the politicians danced in regalia. Hmm. Have you ever thought about why Australia is no longer a democracy but an authoritarian oligarchy? It's ruled by the oligarchs. Well, it's because the very, very, very rich corporations can donate up to $14,000 per politician in a, per electorate. So if there's 151 seats in the Australian Parliament, that is potentially $2.1 million per party from one wealthy donor undeclared. Now, if you did that to one, two, three, four parties, or three parties, that's a lot of money. And then you've got the states as well, which have this similar kind of electoral donation law. So, it leaves a lot of scope for a lot of money to go to political parties 
to push the agenda of the very, very wealthy. Because you and I can't possibly just donate $2.1 million to one political party. Unless you're really, 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 really rich. So that's why there's a big need for a reform of the electoral donation laws in this country of so-called Australia. Oh, the doomsday variant. Have you heard about that? Hmm. All right. Well, this one ends with a bit of swearing. Um, so the last word, but it's not really swearing anyway. It's just like a typical Australian um, adjective. Fuck it. Yeah. All right. The doomsday variant. The doomsday variant makes elephants fly and makes crocodiles grow a hundred metres high. Vampire flies that feast on humans and dogs plus giant purple pigs that eat hardwood logs. The doomsday variant is coming of COVID-22. You don't want to know what it will do to you. It will take away, away your fear and it's like an ointment. You'll be all thriving without a government. The doomsday variant is no laughing joke. I know a mate who got it from a fella's passive smoke. His fingers were blown up like big blue balloons and his feet turned into antique silver spoons. You can catch it once, twice or even thrice. Eating chocolate is the cure, is our best medical advice. And if you see flying elephants, stop having fun. And if you see giant crocodiles, just fucking run! Mm. Oh, it's spring, spring has sprung. A happy spring, deck Tina. Spring, birds sing, ruse hopping. Tree shoots growing, flowers blossoming, warmer winds are blowing, rivers running, creeks flowing from mountains where it was snowing, dawning sun lights, clouds of skies glowing. Spring, birds sing, roos hopping, tree shoots growing. Alright, this is one I wrote on the 31st of August because I asked my friends what rhymes with orange. And this, uh, some of the words that they came up with. I was feeling strange and full of courage, so I rearranged my lozenge to eat an orange sandwich as a strange syringe full of garbage language plunged into my orange plumage. And that's something like that. All right, from the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame in Gaira, I'm just about out of time here tonight. Um, yeah, it's seven seven twenty nine, so I'm just about finished for the for the evening. And um, wow, what am I gonna what am I gonna do? Well, the one that brought me here In, in indirectly. Um, this was written. In February 2018, I took it down to um, 2019 Banjo Patterson Australian Poetry Competition in Orange, and I got third place with this. Well, I went back the next year, and on the way back, I came here and I found this beautiful theatre where I am, and opened the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. This is um, dedicated to the Barkindji people, the Barkindji nation out there on the Barker River, out at Wool Kenya. I stopped there in 2016 and they had their, had a bit of a protest because there was no water in the river. A few years later, there in February 2018, I met a man in Nimbin named Graham Clark and Graham said, we were having a yarn, and he said, our darling's dying. 
Our darling Barker is dying. Our darling is dying and running quite dry, the Barkinji man said. I just want to cry. I went to our darling Barker and all I could see was a dry riverbed no longer flowing free. Dead fish were floating with poison and sick, a long muddy billabong, a blue-green algae slick. Our river would always flow to the sea, even in drought and always flowed free. There was always abundance and plenty of feed, and now it's exploded by corporate greed. Dinners and deals and networks of corruption. The darling is dying, and this is its destruction. Lobby politicians take donations of greed from cotton corporations with their GMO seed. 400,000 megalitres just for cubby station, but no water or fish for the Barkindji nation. Other farms, water theft is also a crime, but the new laws don't stop them. The darling Barker is dying. Cotton farms, water theft, corruption as donations. Our darling Barker is dying because of greedy cotton stations. Out there in Wilcannia, there's no fishing for feed, no waters for veggies, so the garden's full of weeds. Two dollars for an apple, a lettuce, ten or more. A dry river makes us sick and keeps us all poor, just drinking and fighting and wearing a frown, waiting for our darling Barker River to flow down. There's no fishing, no swimming, no camping anymore. There's nothing to do. And life is a bore. A dead ruin the river. But it didn't drown. It died when it drank the poison river water down. It's time that we started, the Barkindji man said, because if the river doesn't flow, the whole country will be dead. We need to free up our darling Barker, bring it back to life, or the whole ecosystem's in trouble and strife. Everything must be done and we have what it takes to naturally refill the whole Menindee Lakes to bring back the Silver Perch, Yellow Valley and Pantu Cobb, our Barker, our source of life, Rainbow Serpent, God, if we don't let the water flow, keep singing this song until our darling Barker is no more muddy billabong. So clean up the river, make it like long before, and our darling Barker will waltz and flow forevermore. But our darling river is dying. Our Barker is dry. The Barkindji man said, I just want to cry. So one more. Before we go, it's a kid's one. I probably could have done it first tonight, but I'm not. It's too late now, so I'm going to do it now. This is one of my favourites, one of everyone's favourites. One of hope, a song of hope. It's about a flying giraffe named Julius. Julius Giraffe was often found trying to lift himself up off the ground because Julius Giraffe had a dream of flying and he never gave up hope or gave up trying. Julius Giraffe wanted to fly so he plotted, planned, calculated and applied but no matter how much he flapped his legs around, Julius Giraffe never got off the ground. Well, Julius Giraffe decided to see if he'd fly like a bird if he jumped from a tree, but Julius Giraffe wasn't a goat. His chance of climbing a tree was quite remote. The baboon yelled out, Julius, giraffe can't fly no matter how much you try. And you try, Julius Giraffe, you're tall and you're grand. You can see far and wide across this here land. You're... Skinny giraffe legs weren't built for flying. Give up on your dream before you die trying. Julius Giraffe wasn't looking out. Didn't see the poachers lurking about. Next thing he knew, Julius woke up in a cage on the back of a poacher's truck. He cried for his family and the baboon 
and the rain on the plain during the monsoon, he was stolen from Africa, taken away, put in an aeroplane, and he flew that day. The moral of the story, listen to this, be very discerning for what you wish. The plane suffered engine failure, went into a dive. The pilot bailed out, he wanted to stay alive. Julius Giraffe was in luck and found the last parachute. Well, he wingsuited down, he flew through the air, he glided with birds, he did a loop, the loop, and his voice was heard young. I'm a flying giraffe, I'm in the sky. Fantastic, amazing, I'm a giraffe who can fly. He landed beside the baboon and the train. I didn't give up hope on my dream and I flew free. It was unexpected. I didn't have to try. I never gave up hope and I got to fly because I never gave up on my hopes, or my dreams. They came true in the most unexpected way it seemed. I'm a flying giraffe. And I didn't die, my dreams all came true, and I flew in the sky, said Julius, the flying giraffe. And that's it from me, Thundercloud, washing away the garbage, leaving rainbows after rains. I'm here at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame, and everybody knows my mum calls me James. Yeah. I'll see you next Wednesday, I'll also see you Sunday, and hopefully I'll see you here on Saturday morning at the Gyra Farmers and Craft Market at the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame from 8.30 to 12.30. If you like this, give it a thumbs up, give it a like, give it a heart, share it with your friends so they can find out about the wonders of poetry, Australian poets and all, and the Australian Poetry Hall of Fame. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.